we start, sort of started, uh, we started our company doing a small sort of uh, work for hire for cell phones. So like back in the pre-iPhone days, we were doing you know, cheesy uh, Java, J2ME stuff. So that was fun. Well, it was not really fun, but you know, it paid the bills for a while. And uh, it sort of um, taught us how to make games, how to make small games. And it sort of uh, got us connected to a lot of awesome pixel artists. Because back in the, the Java days, that's all, you, that's all you could do. You could do small pixel art on like a 64 by 64 screen. Um, most of the time, you're only working with 128 kilobytes of memory to build an entire game. So it was fun times. Uh, so today, I'm talking about Super Time Force. So this is the, the game that I'm working on. Uh, you can see it at the cabinet at the front. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the game itself, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, sort of how the game was created and stuff, because it's kind of an interesting story. So let's start with the, uh, the trailer. So this is a trailer that we put together for PAX Prime, uh, in case anyone hasn't seen it. You can check it out now. I don't think sound is working right now. Oh, it's muted. That is correct. I do not use Macs, as you can see. Cool. Yeah, so that's the trailer. Um, I guess we tried to do something a bit different with this trailer, and I guess the marketing this game in general. Um, I guess uh, for this trailer, like uh, most people kind of uh, treat trailers as something that shows you, like, shows you gameplay, and I guess that's kind of true. But in this case, we kind of wanted to show the humor side of the game because that's a big aspect of the game, like the sense of humor and the sense of style and then sort of the theme of the game. So that's kind of what we want to get across uh, in this trailer. Um, it was all done in-house by uh, one of our awesome artists. Her name is Kelly. 
She's an amazing sort of animator. She did all of the animations herself. Uh, we pretty much just three weeks before PAX Prime, we came up uh, with a with a script. We threw it at her, and then you know gave her three weeks, and she just like pumped that out. So that was pretty amazing. And also Kiko, he's the lead artist for Critter Crunch on uh, PSN. He's helped out with the backgrounds and things like that. So I don't know. I really love the artists at Cappy. And uh, I think one of the things we try to do at Cappy is we try to just sort of let the artists do what they do and, you know, trust in what they do and let them, you know, go crazy with, with, uh, with kind of their style and what they enjoy doing. Um, I guess another reason that we... Uh, decided to take the trailer this route is because it's we, we realized it's sort of difficult to explain the game. Um, we released a teaser trailer um, back, when was that? Sometime before GDC, we released a teaser trailer just showing glimpses of, of the gameplay and it kind of confused people, which was what we kind of expected. Um, and I think that kind of helped us in a way because uh, it, you know, people became interested in the game and then when they got to sit down and play it for the first time at PAX East. They sort of had this sense of discovery, which, which really worked well with the game and what we're going for with the game. Um, okay, so like I said, like it's difficult to sort of explain the game by just watching a video. So I'll just walk you through the demo that we have here today. And I'll sort of commentate as I go. Okay, so overall, so Super Time Force is like a retro-inspired run-and-gun shooter, something like Contra or Gunstar Heroes. Um, so I wanted to have that sort of old-school aesthetic. Uh, also, it's hardcore. It's one-hit kill. Uh, hold on a sec. Turn it down a bit. Yeah, so it takes place in 1980X. I guess that's uh, a common thing you, you saw in the Nintendo and Super Nintendo games when they were trying to be ambiguous with the time. Uh, so it's pretty much about this, this team of soldiers who have access to time travel equipment. And they make it their mission to sort of go back in time and fix all of the mistakes of the past, or you know, mistakes as, as they see them. Um, but in reality, they're just kind of messing things up, messing up the timeline and making things worse for everybody, so. Okay, let's get this started. Okay, so this is your commander, Commander Rapitsky. Uh, as you can see, he's been through a lot. He has two eye patches. Um, so in this, what, what's going on here is that the Earth is being attacked by Blownbots. And Blownbots, it's kind of an interesting story as well. The, the name actually came from one of our artists. Uh, actually, this whole game, the art is only done by two artists. They're twin brothers, which kind of makes it really cool. Uh, Mike and Vic. Uh, so Vic doesn't talk very much. Instead of talking, he just sort of makes sounds. Uh, and one of the sounds he makes is Blown. So we decided, let's name the robots that he likes to draw after that. So we call them Blownbots. And all of the writing that you see is uh, done by Dan Vader. He was also the lead writer in uh, Might and Magic Clash of Heroes, if you're familiar with that game. OK, so there's several player classes. There's Jean Rambois. He's like a typical machine gun guy. There's Lady Sniper, who has lasers. There's a Shieldy Blockerson. He's a sort of a melee guy who can reflect bullets. And there's Jeff Leopard. He's sort of the rocker, rocket man guy from, from the 80s. So you jump in, you run around, you shoot, you charge up your secondary ability, and you just run around and try to kill everything. But as you're playing, you will inevitably die. Hopefully I can die. So every time you die, what happens is that time rewinds back to the beginning. And then you get to play again. And you can select a different character. 
And then when you play, you're actually gonna be playing alongside your previous self. So that was me, like five seconds ago, running around. And then as you can see, he's killing everyone, and then he also will die. So it's sort of the more you die, the bigger of the team you're creating for yourself. And since everyone sort of plays differently, you're sort of trying to strategize and, and uh, strategize with, with all the different characters working together to sort of deal with the situations that, that you come across. So shieldy, why would you want a shield? Well, with the shield, you can reflect bullets. And by reflecting bullets, you can actually prevent your, your previous deaths. So as you can see, this guy who would have killed him, I killed him first. So this guy's not dead anymore. So he's sort of stuck in this time paradox. So what I can do is I can retrieve him and get that life back. So now it's as if I didn't die and I didn't lose that life. And that becomes really useful in, in, in this game and, and how you strategize. So since I just saved Jean Rambois, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna rewind back to that particular moment in time. And since he's not actually dead, I'm gonna continue playing as him. And then now I also remember what killed Shieldy Blockerson, so maybe I can run ahead and try to prevent that from happening. Or I can get shot in the face. Alright, let's try some Jeff Leopard. So even though when you play this game you die a lot, um, it's, it's sort of supposed to not be s s that frustrating because every death, well almost every death is sort of uh, fixable. You can sort of save every single person who ever died. So you could potentially play the whole game and still have your full 30 lives by the end of it. Which is sort of uh, the direction we wanted to take the game. It's sort of retro-inspired in that it's hardcore and that you die a lot, but at the same time, we didn't want it to be frustrating in that sense. Thank you for the fanciful fair poster, by the way. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you, you guys recognize that logo. There's also some, some power-ups in the game. So this is overdrive. It makes your weapon uh, permanently fully charged, which is pretty awesome. Apparently, I'm supposed to be the best person at this game, so it gives you an indication of how hard this is. talk a little bit about the charging mechanic? Uh, yeah, so we also kind of uh, wanted to design this game to be a two-button game. You know, so it could be played on a ni Nintendo controller if that's what you like to game on. So it's just D-pad, eight directions, jump, and shoot. And if you hold down shoot, you sort of charge up your secondary ability. And that's pretty much all you need to do to, to play this game, which makes it really well suited to the arcade cabinet, which was awesome. Did not expect that. And then after you pass a level, it sh sort of shows you uh, like a Super Meat Boy type of replay of everything you just did. Uh, an interesting thing about this is that when you watch the replay, you, you realize how short the levels are and, and how, how, quick the, you know, how quick the gameplay actually was. It's like 15, 20 seconds of game, but even though it took you like five minutes to pass the level. So it's kind of interesting like that. Anyways, I'll skip ahead. Yeah, so this is sort of a 
showcasing uh, Commander Rapitsky, he decides, hey, let's go back in time to the dinosaur days. I have a great idea. Let's prevent the dinosaurs' extinction by destroying the asteroid that kills the dinosaurs. So that's, we're trying to you know, give you a glimpse of what the dinosaur world is going to be like. All the sound and voices you hear are done by our sound designer at Cappy, Sean. He's also a producer on uh, a lot of the projects that we do. We never asked him to do voice work, but he seems to just do it without us asking him. He also sang the theme song for Super Time Force, which is also kind of crazy because I don't think he's an actually a singer. Here's a cool power up. Slow mo. Well, that kind of sucked. Okay, so the thing about power ups is that um, if I want to get that power up again, I'm actually going to have to race my previous self to get it before he gets it because only one person can get that power up. So you kind of create these situations for yourself where you're actually racing against your past self if you want to do something. Okay, now it's going to be difficult to get this power up. Oh yeah. So this is kind of it. Okay, I just killed myself again. This is why they tell you not to sort of uh, talk and play at the same time because it's pretty much impossible. <sighs> now you can you can save your past selves from getting killed. Can you by changing things uh, cause them to get killed earlier than they got killed before? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. So I know that guy's going to die by this dinosaur here. So if I just clear out all these dinosaurs, then that guy didn't die anymore. So yeah, this slow-mo power-up, like everything's traveling slow. I'm traveling at normal speed. Um, but actually, what's actually happening is that I'm actually traveling 10 times normal speed. Which was sort of a nightmare to program. Because anyone who's done physics knows that when you start traveling really fast, you start falling through the floor and walls and stuff like that. So. So that means when you go back and see the super meat, bo meat boy view at the yeah, end, he's, like he's going to be super just fast. zipping around. Yeah. Neat. And that's some huge dinosaur poop right there. Oh, yeah. So we also wanted to have dinosaur turds that splash around for some reason. That was a big request that a lot of people at studio wanted to see. So. Okay, so hopefully you can see this this sort of slow-mo in action. So this is sort of another thing that you're going to see. As you travel through these time periods, um, you're always going to be running across these blown bots, which is kind of weird. Um, but we're trying to tie the blown bots into you know, certain events in history to sort of explain why things happen.
Any specific inspiration for the giant gun-toting cyborg uh, Tyrannosaurus? It looks like a toy from the 80s. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what, what we were going for. We realized that there was a toy line of, like, dinosaur riders. I don't know what it was called. Was it called dinosaur riders? It was pretty much uh, di dinosaurs outfitted with futuristic uh, robotic armor and lasers and stuff. So we thought that was pretty much the coolest thing we've ever seen. So we wanted to have that in the game. And also, anytime you play a game with dinosaurs, you have to fight a T-Rex, apparently. That's, that's like a rule of making dinosaur games. It was also fun because uh, once we, as soon as we decided to do the dinosaur world, uh, Vic, the, the pixel artist, got really, really excited. And he started buying all sorts of dinosaur books and doing dinosaur research. So he's sort of an expert in uh, dinosaurs now, which kind of makes it difficult for me because I say, I say stuff like, hey, let's have a dinosaur that's, that spits acid at you. And he's like, no, there's actually no dinosaur that exists, so we can't do that. And the one you saw in Jurassic Park, that was actually made up as well. Zachosaurus. So another thing you can do as you're jumping through time periods, you're gonna you're gonna encounter uh, different characters, um, and in each time period, we're gonna have so that uh, have it so that you can sort of unlock a bunch of different characters for that time period, and they'll become uh, playable characters as well. So in this time period, you unlock Zachosaurus, you know, the sort of funky, fresh uh, dinosaur from the '80s, who's got his Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses and skateboard. So he plays a bit differently. He's like a melee character who can do dashes. Um, so that's the thing we want to do. That's kind of a, how we want to approach this game. Like every character should play significantly differently and be useful in different ways. Yeah, so Zach also talks in uh, 80s raps. And he has a catchphrase, Kookabunga. Because I think Cowabunga was copyrighted, uh, and Kookamunga is an actual place. Yeah, as you see, as you're fighting this asteroid, you realize it's not really an asteroid, but there's actually a giant brown bot ship, because I guess they're out to destroy the dinosaurs for whatever reason. It's Zachosaurus in here. What happened there is I actually ran out of time. So there's a clock at the top of the screen that tells you you only have, thir you have 30 seconds sort of to exist. 
Um, that's sort of there to sort of push you ahead. Uh, and sort of uh, force you to sort of kill guys. Because uh, killing enemies is sort of how you recover time back. So we destroyed the asteroid, and the dinosaurs are giving us thumbs up, uh, which is also inaccurate because I don't believe dinosaurs had opposable thumbs, but I could be wrong. So, thank you. So this sort of sets up the premise of the game where you do go back in time, you travel through all these time periods, you try to fix history, but what you end up doing is messing up uh, the present for yourself. So in this case, what happened was that you changed history, so now dinosaurs exist in the present, and then the T-Rex president decides that they don't want humans around anymore, so then you're going to have to go around and deal with that. And the game just crashed. Yay. Come on. You want to take a question or two from the floor while you're uh, getting uh, set back yeah, up? Yeah, sure. Does any anybody questions? have any questions? Evan, it's going to be about accordions. I, I really like the diatonics. Um, uh, so I'm curious how many, uh, how much iteration there's been on the game mechanics. This seems like the sort of system where you've probably gone through a couple different ways of the, the core time manipulation mechanics working. Um, yeah, like the, the development process has been, has been pretty interesting. Um, well, I guess for us as a studio, because we're sort of medium size-ish, um, so we usually have you know teams that aren't tiny. They aren't big, but they aren't tiny, like maybe like five, six, seven people per team. Uh, this project is one of the smaller teams. It's just uh, me, the programmer, the two artists, and the designer. Um, so it's a pretty small team. So pretty much, if you want to try something, I just program it in. Uh, we let people play it and see what they think about it. And if it's cool, then we'll try to keep it in and polish it up and refine it. And if it's not, then we'll just toss it out and sort of keep it in mind. Yeah, I don't know how to fix this. Sorry. But but yeah, um, the actual core mechanic was what I, I kind of wanted to talk about, if I can get this working. Um, can get you some help. I'm not very good with computers. It's uh, yeah. a nice thing about this event. We've got some people handy that 
do in fact use computers? I hear they're the future. Cool. Um, so yeah, so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about where the game came from. So it came out of a game jam. Um, so in Toronto, every year they have this big game jam called the TO Jam or the, or the TO Jam. Uh, it's, it, it's getting bigger and bigger every year. Um, this year was about 400 people kind of jam-packed taking over this uh, university campus and it's totally amazing. So what we did uh, last year, um, we decided to sort of send a few guys. So me and two of the artists decided to go there. Uh, there was a bunch of other guys who went there as well. So we, yeah, it was a, it was a big group of us. Um, and we broke off into teams. Uh, I, I work really well with the, the two artists I work with. Uh, we do a lot of work together. So I find in a game jam that's really, really important to have a team that can work quickly and you, know, you can communicate really effectively. Um, I actually took a time-lapse video of me working on this game. So I'll have this playing in the background. It's not much to watch because it's mostly just typing, but it gives you a sense of the progression of the game from start to finish. Uh, so this was over the course of three days. I guess it was about 60 hours. Um, you know, a lot of people just stay there overnight, sleep on the floor. Uh, I'm not that hardcore, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so it was, it was an interesting event. Uh, so every year they give you a theme. So last year the theme was what just happened. Uh, I guess it's meant to be sort of open-ended. So what just happened, I, I sort of uh, interpreted it as sort of time travel. You know, maybe we can make a game out of somehow utilizing the knowledge of what just happened. Um, and also I've always, I've always really wanted to make a run and gun shooter because, you know, Contra, Gunstar Heroes are pretty much my favorite games ever. So I thought, what if it was a Contra game with some sort of time traveling mechanic? Uh, another thing that I really liked is, I don't know if you've ever seen these track mania videos. There's like 10,000 replays where like people online sort of just submit the replays and someone just kind of combines them all together and makes this crazy replay. It looks like an ocean of cars just sort of flowing through a level and it's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. And of course like Super Meat Boy does the same thing when you pass a level. So I thought these things are like really awesome maybe we, you can somehow make a game mechanic out of it. So it's, you're not just watching all these things happening, but they're somehow helping you out and uh, contributing to, to you sort of uh, getting through situations. So that's sort of how the idea sort of came about. Um, so yeah, it was Toe Jam. It was the first sort of uh, big game jam that was outside of the studio that, that we did. So it was, a, it was a pretty interesting experience for me. Like I'm a total proponent of, of game jams now. I think there's something that people just need to do because, I don't know, it's kind of refreshing. If you're not used to working in, at a fast pace in a really tiny team, I think it's really good to sort of get that into your system to see, to see what it's like. Um, you know, it, to me, it's sort of fun. It's like uh, in school when you're sort of cramming with, with, your, with your buddies, finishing a project, doing all-nighters and stuff. Like, I don't know, people hate that, but I, to me, I, I, those are fun times. And when you're at a game jam, that's pretty much what it feels like for several days straight. You're just like in a, in like a, a computer lab, surrounded by people, everyone's cramming and joking around and having a good time. So it's just a fun time in general. Um, it's also good because it's a, it's a reason for a bunch of developers to be together that might not normally meet up. So you, know, you get to meet a lot of people, but get surrounded by a lot of inspirational people. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really good environment, and I would really recommend it. In the in the earlier screens when it was showing all the was that randomly generating a field like a field of tiles of triangles, yeah, yeah. and then you were using that as inspiration to draw like a level. Yeah, that's cool. So like before you have like there was no level editor as I was making it, so I just randomly dropped tiles in with ran like uh, and then I, I I slowly sort of created a level editor as I was going just by drawing and deleting tiles. That's sort of the basis of of the level editor. Um, so yeah. And how long was the period for Toe Jam again? How long uh, Toe Jam is about two and a half days. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, like um, I'm pretty sure most of you have done game jams. If you haven't, I would totally re recommend it. You know, it, it, the other thing that game jams are good for is sort of, it forces you to be razor focused on one thing and to sort of 
just sort of figure out how to complete one small thing from start to finish, which is really good. I mean, like a lot of indie devs who do kind of stuff on their spare time. Well, I don't know about it, but I find me personally, like I'll come up with an idea, I'll work on it for a while, it'll be like 25% done, and then I'll just get tired of it, and I'll just leave it and never do anything with it, which kind of sucks because a lot of times people have really great ideas. And with a game jam, it sort of fo forces you to sort of complete that whole idea. And then once you're done, you have this sort of playable nugget, which can help motivate you to sort of uh, keep working on it because it's not just this half-baked kind of idea that's kind of difficult to look at. So, you know, a lot of interesting things can come out of game jams. And I found that um, a lot of the work that I did here was a result of other ideas that I had that I never had time to finish. So I'm kind of glad that I was able to incorporate a lot of these ideas into a finished product and, you know, see it come to life. Okay, this is a pretty long video. I can just sort of skip ahead. So like I really had no idea of the scope of this game when I started. I thought it would just be sort of like a mindless, you know, run from point A to point B. And uh, I sort of made all the levels randomly generate. The, it just like randomly spawns corridors and, and, uh, and hallways and enemies and platforms and things like that. And it was pretty fun. Um, and by the end of it, uh, it, it was a pretty decent playable prototype. It had five playable classes. It had, uh, it had the rewind mechanic in, um, but it didn't really have the whole saving mechanic and checkpoint mechanic in. That was something that came a lot later. Uh, it actually came about pretty much three days before we showed it at PAX East, uh, which was kind of crazy. And this goes to show you how, how, how quickly things change and how quickly ideas come and go with a small team like this. Um, so yeah, this is this video. I can actually show you the resulting prototype that came out of this. There was no sound because uh, I didn't have time to implement any sound and we didn't have a sound guy. Uh, it was also called Super Time Squad back then, uh, which I thought was a cool name until we realized that Time Squad was actually a cartoon on the Cartoon Network, and I think they had the rights to digital media for it, so we had to change it. Um, so in here, we have the rocket guy, we have the machine gun guy, we have an engineer, we have sniper and the shield guy. So, you know, there's a lot of familiar faces. The engineer is kind of cool. He can uh, build turrets and he drops them. And he can uh, drop them in different directions. So yeah, as you can see, like it's not very polished. It's kind of incoherent. It's kind of very noisy. Uh, but you know, so what happened was that after we finished this, uh, we took it back to the studio and we let people play it, sort of a show and tell of what, what people did at the game jam. And uh, people really, really uh, liked this idea and they thought it was really cool. Everyone had a lot, a lot of fun playing it. Um, so Nathan, sort of the, the founder and the president at Cappy, you know, he decided this is really cool. You know, maybe we should not just forget about these little things. Um, so he suggested maybe me and the two artists uh, sort of keep working on this uh, as sort of a side project. So he said maybe every Friday you guys can spend your Fridays working on this instead of your main projects. Um, so that was kind of interesting. It's something that we've never done before, um, but we decided you know, it was worth a shot. I really like this. I'm really excited about this game. The artists really enjoyed working on it, so why not? So we worked on it every Friday for a few months. Um, and then I think it was around the GDC submissions. I believe that was around October, November-ish. We decided, you know, we got this thing. It's cool. Uh, people are really digging it. Maybe we should uh, try to get it out there and try to get some feedback on it. So um, we thought GDC, the, the IGF, the Independent Games Festival, uh, in case you guys don't know, it's sort of like uh, people can submit their games to be judged by a panel of judges and get feedback. Um, so we decided to do that. So we sort of packaged up uh, a demo, sort of polished up some of the art, built some more levels. Yeah, so this is pretty buggy. I don't know what's going on. Well, whatever. Yeah, so 
we sort of uh, decided to package up a demo. We sent it off to GD or the, the IGF. Um, and then we got back some really awesome feedback and like the, the people who played it really, really liked it. Um, and then it was kind of crazy, but a few weeks before PAX East, uh, we heard back from Microsoft. So uh, Microsoft last year, I think it was their first year of um, sort of sponsoring the, the IGF awards. Um, so p as part of that, what they did was that they offered up uh, an award called the Xbox Live Arcade Award. And that's pretty much like a publishing deal for Xbox Live Arcade. Um, so a few weeks before PAX Eats, we found out that they really liked the game and they wanted to see if, you know, if we, we were interested in, in this uh, publishing deal. So of course, you know, th this would be awesome. So we were trying to work out a contract and we finally signed the contract. Like, I think it was literally the day of the, the, the IGF awards, which is kind of crazy. Like we, otherwise we couldn't have gone up and uh, accepted the award if we didn't uh, finalize the contract yet. So that was pretty crazy. Um, so all of these things combined, it's sort of like, we didn't really know that this was gonna be, become like one of our main projects. It was just sort of a cool thing that we wanted to do on the side. But after the, you know, the IGF award, we realized, you know, well, well, obviously now we have to make it into a full game because we have this contract and we can't just, you know, sit on our thumbs. Um, so that was really exciting for us. That sort of, it pushed us ahead and it made us realize that, you know, we can do small things and, and they can still be cool. Uh, we can still do our big things and work on those, but you know, we sort of uh, embrace all the opportunities we get. Um, so people still didn't really know what the game was about. Uh, we didn't really release any information or anything about it at, at the IGF, so it was still sort of mysterious. So it wasn't until sort of PAX East, that was the first, I guess, public showing of the game. Uh, so we just had this booth where we were showing Sword and Sorcery, the Steam version, which was coming out around that time, and we had a few uh, TVs set up for uh, Super Time Force. And then, you know, the response was just amazing. Like, uh, it was overwhelmingly positive. People came back to play it over and over again. I had guys, like, beating it over and over again, coming back day after day. Uh, guys, you know, it's, it, was a, it was an overwhelmingly positive response and that sort of, you know, I, I guess validated for me this project um, and, real, and made me realize that, you know, maybe this project is something bigger than, than, than I realized it was too. So uh, ever since then we were sort of now going into full production, which I find has been a bit tricky because, uh, you know, for that whole period of the year, you know, from the PAX East to the PAX Prime, uh, Indiecade, uh, Fantastic Fest, there's all these events that, that happen and, and I find that every time we have an event we sort of spend a few weeks just putting together a demo, which is cool, I like doing that, but that since I'm the only programmer, like there's no one actually working on, on real content, um, so it's sort of uh, difficult to sort of balance the two, but I think after Indiecade, that's probably the last event we'll probably go to this year so that we can actually finish this game sometime. Um, yeah, we're aiming to have this game out sometime mid next year on uh, Xbox Live Arcade. So we will see how it goes, but so far things are going pretty good. So, anyways, that's all I have to say. Great. <laughs> no. Yeah, no problem. Any uh, any questions from the floor? Uh, so it's all written in uh, C plus plus. It's sort of, it started off, like it's not, it's kind of a really basic engine that I use to do prototyping with. Uh, so I just sort of built up off that. It's not the greatest, it's not the most, it's not the fastest, and it's only really um, sort of designed to handle low res pixel art like this, but for this game it was perfect. Um, yeah, that's another thing about this game, like the pixel art, I guess bec the reason we went with the pixel art was partly because it, it was a game jam and pixel art is kind of, easier to manage when you're at a game jam, like the resources are smaller, the artists can sort of do things more quickly. Um, but at the same time, the artists just love doing pixel art. So, you know, a, th a thing that we do at CAP is we make sure that the artists do the things th that they want to do. And we sort of enable them and, and empower them to do that, to sort of dictate the, the, the sort of direction of the game in a sense. So it was, it was sort of twofold like that. Any additional questions? All right. Thank you so much, Ken. Cool. Thanks for having me. Ken.
So coming up at uh, 1 o'clock, we'll be talking to Justin Ma about his game uh, FTL, Faster Than Light. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to once again thank our sponsors, Sony, who's out there with these, those awesome PS3 and Vita kiosks with some fantastic arcade curated games. Alienware, who provided all the laptops that are on the floor there. Devolver and Gambitious, our good buddies. Uh, also Adobe this year and uh, Valve's Steam service. Uh, and we'll see you guys at 1 o'clock.